years, um, I put together this event with Professor Ingram, Hannah Parra, and Sean Meyer at the Union of Concerned Scientists. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ira Halvan, co-president of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, co-founder and past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the recipient of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize and this year's um, Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. David Wright, co-director of the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists and nationally known expert on the technical aspects of nuclear weapons policy, missile defense systems, and missile proliferation. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, it's a really good crowd. I'm really pleased to see this. We had, um, I guess, three goals for tonight. Uh, the first one was to start by giving some background on, on sort of the nuclear <coughs> arms race, the nuclear weapons situation, and talk about some of the issues we see that are going to be important in the, in the coming years. Uh, the second thing then is to talk about what we see as some of the solutions to those issues. And the third one is to leave plenty of time for discussion and questions. So we're going to try and be fairly brief. If there's something you hear you'd like more information about, jot it down and we'd be happy to answer questions, talk about it afterwards. So let me start by saying what has changed since the Cold War. The Cold War ended around 1991, uh, and what's happened at that time? Well, the first thing that's happened is there have been very big cuts in nuclear arsenals. Uh, this is a graph that shows uh, 1960, 1970, 1980, end of the Cold War, 1991, and up to the present time. Uh, and what you see in, in uh, red is the Soviet and then the Russian uh, nuclear weapons. And on top of that, uh, U.S. weapons. And this little bit over here that you can sort of see popping up is everybody else in the world. And we'll come back to who, who owns those. Um, as you see here in the middle, the middle of the 1980s, uh, the, the combined number of nuclear weapons was more than 60,000 between, between the uh, U.S. and, and uh, Soviet Union. A series of arms control treaties brought those down pretty dramatically. And especially after the end of the Cold War, uh, there were uh, both arms control agreements and some reciprocal measures uh, outside of arms control that brought those numbers down. Uh, one of those was the New START Treaty, uh, which uh, President Obama uh, got ratified in, in 2011. Uh, and not only did that bring the numbers down, but it also put in, well, kept in place some very intrusive inspection uh, measures. So there are uh, a lot of it, uh, verification measures uh, that are part of that arms control agreement. And one of the reasons that people like me tend to like uh, arms control agreements is that they include uh, verification and they include communication between the, the, the countries. Uh, this treaty new start expires in 2021. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, we'll talk about later is we think it's really important for the United States and Russia to talk about extending that treaty and extending the verification uh, measures. The other thing that's happened uh, since the Cold War is that the number of states with nuclear weapons have changed. Uh, and it's actually, surprisingly enough, changed both for the good and for bad. Uh, South Africa was developing nuclear weapons. Uh, and in the period of 1989-1991, when it was clear that the white uh, the government was going to fall, they decided to get rid of their nuclear weapons and they, they basically uh, worked with the international community to convince the world that they had gotten rid of their, their nuclear weapons program. The other thing that happened was when the Soviet Union broke up, three of those countries, Ukraine, Belarus, and Georgia, uh, all had nuclear weapons uh, on their territory that were originally Soviet weapons. And there was a real question at that time of whether they would agree to get rid of those and send them back to uh, Russia, or whether they would want to keep them in it and become sort of de facto nuclear powers. And there was a lot of work that was done at that time. Uh, the United States was a key player in that uh, to convince those three countries to get rid of those nuclear weapons, to send them back to Russia, uh, and to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear states. Uh, and so that was a real success that that happened. And, and as I said, at the time, it was not clear that that would necessarily happen. Now on the negative side, uh, both India and Pakistan have 
tested nuclear weapons at this point, and as I'll show you later, are believed to have uh, surprisingly large arsenals, uh, we'll see. And most recently, uh, North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon in 2006. Um, uh, and in September uh, of this year, so just uh, two months ago, uh, did a very large test, which most of us believe was, in fact, a hydrogen bomb test. So that it's moved well beyond um, sort of early generation weapons. And again, happy to come back and talk about any of this if people have questions. So again, just as an overview of who has what, there are nine countries today uh, that are known to possess nuclear weapons. The biggest two are the U.S. and Russia. Uh, you can see that between them they have about 9,000 total warheads. Uh, a good fraction of those, about half of those, are stored and could be put on either bombers or missiles, uh, but are not currently uh, on delivery systems. And both of them have something between 1,600 and 2,000 weapons that are currently in the field uh, deployed, uh, and about half of those could be launched within a couple minutes. So I'll come back to that. That's this notion of hair trigger alert, the idea that you could launch things very quickly. Uh, besides those two, the uh, other three states that have been traditionally made up the five uh, uh, nuclear weapon states, uh, France, China, and, and uh, UK, and you can see that the numbers of weapons they have are in the order of a couple hundred. Uh, one thing that's interesting here with China, you see, is, is the deployed strategic warheads is zero, and that's because China's believed to keep their warheads uh, separate from their missiles and other delivery systems. And so they're actually not in a state that they're ready to be launched. There would have to be two different decisions made to release the warheads and the delivery systems and bring them together. And then the other states, uh, Pakistan and India, as I said, both tested weapons around 1998, have, we believe, uh, something over 100. We don't know whether those are currently deployed. We, we think not, we hope not that they're actually uh, in storage and could be made ready to be used, but, but aren't currently ready. Uh, Israel is believed to have about 100. Uh, and North Korea, um, I have a 10 question mark here. North Korea is thought to have enough nuclear material to make something between about 20 and maybe 60 weapons. Uh, we have no idea how many it actually has or whether or not that material is just uh, currently uh, uh, in storage. But the point here is that we have on the order of 10,000 nuclear weapons uh, in global arsenals today. Uh, in addition to, to the ones that, that you see in this chart, uh, the U.S. and Russia have about 5,000 between them that are in storage and are going to be uh, dismantled, but at this point still exist. So the worldwide total is something like 15,000 weapons, and something like 94% of those are in the U.S. and uh, and Russian arsenals. Uh, the second uh, change that I think was a change for the, for the better uh, uh, is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So in 1996, the United Nations uh, uh, adopted a, 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 a treaty that banned uh, the testing of nuclear weapons. Uh, it has now been signed by 183 different countries and ratified by 166. Uh, the bad news is that <coughs> uh, in order to enter into force, so legally become a binding treaty, uh, it needs to be signed by uh, several countries that uh, have not yet, it needs to be ratified by several countries that have signed but not uh, ratified, and it needs to be signed and ratified by several countries that haven't signed yet. And so uh, when that happens, uh, nobody knows, it's probably going to be a while. The good news is that the countries that have signed it have said that, that they will continue to abide by it, uh, even though it has not been ratified. Um, so that's, I think that's really a, a positive thing. One of the results of these, um, I think these, you know, the, the fact that there was much less tension between the U.S. and Soviet Union and then Russia uh, and the reduction of arsenals is that people pretty much forgot about nuclear weapons. I mean, if you talk to people, you know, Fifteen years ago, they basically, a lot of people assumed that nuclear weapons had just all got, been gotten rid of, that it was no longer an issue, and after the Cold War, the problem had been solved. Uh, but today, that's clearly not true. Nuclear weapons are back in the headlines, and so the question is, what are some of the issues that we're dealing with? Well, the first one is uh, North Korea. 
which you've heard a lot about. North Korea now has uh, tested long-range missiles, uh, possibly long enough to reach the United States, depending on some of the technical details. Uh, and the, as I said, their most recent <coughs> test, which was about uh, had a yield about 10 times larger than the bomb that was used in Hiroshima, uh, we think was, a, was likely a hydrogen bomb test. Now we don't know, that you see a picture here of Kim Jong-un with a model of that, of the hydrogen bomb. We don't know if that was actually what they tested or, or if the thing they tested was considerably bigger and heavier than that, which means we don't know if they could actually, if they have a hydrogen bomb they could deliver. Uh, I think most people believe that, uh, that going forward, if they don't have it yet, uh, they will be able to get to that point uh, relatively soon. Uh, another concern is Indian, pa India and Pakistan uh, has always been it's a potential flashpoint. Uh, it's been a concern for many years because they've had a number of conventional conflicts. They share a long border, a long uh, animosity, uh, and now the concern is that those uh, conflicts could go nuclear since both of them have nuclear weapons. Uh, there's increased tension with Russia uh, between what happened in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. Uh, Russia is known to be building some new nuclear systems, including a remote control drone nuclear submarine, um, uh, hypersonic weapons, a new generation of weapons. And so uh, there's concern, uh, certainly in the, in the people I talk to in the US military, about uh, what Russia is doing. Uh, we don't know all that well, and so part of it is, is, is trying to guess what they're doing and trying to guess why. Uh, and so there are some issues there. And another thing that uh, people heard about about a year ago and has not been such a big deal now is a potential conflict with China. One of the problems with China is that there are a number of uh, disputed territories in the South China Sea uh, that are claimed by a number of different countries. And uh, this is sort of a confusing uh, uh, diagram. But what you see here, this red line, for example, is the region that uh, China claims as, as its own territory. And that includes a number of these islands here. Uh, but you can see that Vietnam also uh, uh, claims them, and uh, the Philippines claims some of these. So there are a number of, of um, islands out there that are seen as potentially strategic for, uh, for defense purposes that are claimed by several different countries. Uh, those, um, those claims have basically sat for a long time. The countries have decided we don't know how to solve this and we're not going to push the issue. Uh, but about a year ago, for complicated reasons, China started to sort of push forward with uh, building up some of those, those islands and, and in some cases putting anti-aircraft um, uh, weapons on them. Now one of the things that uh, people like me worry about is that uh, by drawing this line, China basically says that it, it, has, it claims that it has control over this area of the sea. Uh, the United States and other countries believe that that's largely international waters. And to try and set the precedent that it's international waters, the US, for example, will send warships to cruise through this to basically say we're exercising our right to be in this area. Uh, China's not happy about that. It, in several cases, has, uh, has uh, buzzed some of the ships with, with aircraft. And you could imagine a case where, even if neither side wanted to escalate, uh, that there would be an accident something would happen that, that could spark a crisis that might get out of control. Now the good news is that there has been uh, pretty good communication between the United States and China, uh, certainly in, in the last uh, six to eight months. Uh, and so this has become less of an issue. China has also uh, gone to some of its neighbors and said, let's cool this down, let's, let's uh, uh, you know, put, put this issue on ice and, and try to keep things from getting out of control. So, I actually feel much better about uh, this issue than I, than I would have if I had been giving this talk, say, six or eight months ago. Uh, so before I turn it over to Ira, uh, there, the other piece of, of uh, sort of nuclear issues that we think about are issues that arise from U.S. nuclear policies, and things that we think are uh, potentially dangerous that we would like to see uh, changed. The first one is that uh, the United States at this point has a plan to rebuild and enhance uh, essentially all the legs of its nuclear arsenal. Uh, and the price tag would be enormous. It would be, uh, the estimates are something like $1.2 trillion uh, over 30 years. So a tremendous amount of, of money. Um, 
But since the United States already has the, the most advanced nuclear force, the other problem with this is that it sends a signal to other countries like Russia and China that maybe they should be worried about where the U.S. is headed. And so again, it's one of these things where uh, when other countries see the United States uh, talking about using its, its technology to build a whole new uh, generation of, of weapons, uh, they start to get nervous. Uh, and that's especially a problem when you couple it with the notion of missile defense. Uh, and again, happy to talk more about missile defenses. Um, one of the problems there is that if, you, um, if you're trying to reduce the number of nuclear weapons that both sides have, and at the same time one country is starting to build up defenses against nuclear weapons, then it starts to become a barrier to countries wanting to reduce their arsenals because they're worried that, that at some point they may not be able to uh, convince the other country that they have the ability to retaliate and that deterrence will, will start to become weak. <coughs> I have to turn my phone off. Uh, another issue that I think people haven't really heard much about and are surprised by is this notion of what's called tailored nu nuclear options. Uh, and that's the idea that you could develop small yield and very high accurate uh, nuclear weapons that people could think about using in tactical situations rather than just deterrence. Um, so uh, the concern about these <coughs> is that if they're really uh, smaller yield and high accuracy, that you could think about using them in ways that didn't kill a lot of people, that you could uh, think about using them in military, for military targets. Uh, and the concern then is that it starts to lower the threshold for people thinking about using nuclear weapons in the first place. And, and that's certainly a concern. And it starts to sound, sound like what people used to call nuclear war fighting, which is one of the things people talked about with tactical nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Uh, and so this is something, an ongoing debate right now, that again is, is likely to um, uh, continue over the, the coming years. Uh, and one thing I'll come back to in the second section is, it's important to remember, and I think most people don't know this, is that the U.S. reserves the right to use nuclear weapons first. Uh, and I think that surprises a lot of people, but uh, we can come back and talk about it. But what that means is that, uh, that in some situations, the United States sees nuclear weapons uh, not just for retaliation and not just for deterrence, but actually for uh, potentially using the different way. More generally, I think, um, and this is, this is an issue that Ira's talked about that I think is actually quite important, is that people tend to think about the U.S. nuclear deterrent as being this body of, of weapons that keeps us safe by, by uh, uh, convincing other countries that they shouldn't attack. Uh, but, th but there are two problems with that that people have started to talk about more and more recently. And the first one is um, the risk of accidental launch of nuclear weapons. Uh, this is an issue that I, a lot of people haven't thought about, uh, and we've done quite a bit of work on. If you go back over the last couple decades, there are a surprising number of times when either through uh, uh, pers uh, you know, uh, human mistake or mistakes with sensors or with computers, uh, people have thought that there was an incoming attack and have started to prepare to launch a retaliatory attack. Uh, and because the way uh, these systems are set up, you have a very short amount of time to be able to decide whether or not you're going to launch in a situation like that. And so the president would probably have something like six to eight minutes to try and figure out what's happening, is this a real attack, should we, should we launch a response? Uh, some people actually believe that uh, the risk of nuclear war starting by accident is, is a bigger threat than a nuclear war starting in other ways. Uh, so that's, a, again, an issue we can come back and talk about, but it's a, it's a real issue. So, so one problem of having uh, the nuclear arsenal structured the way we have now is the risk that it may get out of control and we would have an accidental nuclear war. And the second one uh, is a concern about what's called sole authority for launching. Uh, that in the United States, the president has sole authority to order a launch, and nobody in the chain of command has a legal, a legal right to stop that uh, decision. Uh, there is, has been a, people have talked about this for any number of years, that um, uh, it seems like no one person should have the ability to start a nuclear war. Um, that has come to a head with, in, under President Trump because people are concerned about the fact that he seems impulsive. Some of the tweets he's, he's written make it sound like you know, he may be 
um, more inclined to, to react to something uh, than some of his predecessors. Whether that's true, we don't really know, but it's, it's sort of brought this whole uh, issue home. And even Senator Corker of Tennessee, who's the Republican head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has come out publicly and said he's worried about this and believes that this idea that, that the President of the United States has sole authority to order a launch should be changed and is planning to have hearings in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to look at this. So that's my introduction. Let me turn it over to Ira. Just sort of sketched out something of the landscape of what we have in the world today in terms of nuclear weapons and some of the scenarios in which they can be used. I just want to underline something that you said and make sure that it came through clearly enough. The danger of nuclear war today is greater going to be two small bombs on two cities. It's going to be a lot of bombs on a lot of cities, and they're going to be much bigger than the bombs that we used in Japan in 45. But for the purpose of our scenario, we assume the Indians and the Pakistanis used relatively small weapons, about the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And we said 50 on each side, 100 all together. Um, the direct effects of this, of this war in South Asia, it's hard to compete with going there. <laughs> The direct effects of the war in South Asia involving these high nuclear weapons are unbelievably catastrophic. 20 million people died in the first week from the explosions and the fires and the radiation. To put that in perspective, during all of World War II, about 50 million people died worldwide over the course of eight years. This would be a similar number in the course of a single week taking place in one section of the world. But these local effects in South Asia are only a very small part of the story because these 100 nuclear weapons detonated over cities, caused enormous fires that put about 6.5 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere. And this causes worldwide climate disruption. The whole planet cools. Growing seasons around the world shorten. There's less precipitation because cooler air uh, causes less water to evaporate from the oceans and fall back as rain and snow. As a, as a result of this, we get a catastrophic decline in food production across the planet. We studied carefully what would happen to corn production, uh, soybean production here in the United States, wheat production, rice production, corn production in China. These are the world's two largest food producers. What we find is a decline that goes anywhere from 15 to 39 percent of agricultural output, lasting for a full decade. The world today did not absorb that kind of decline in food production. There are 795 million people in the world who are malnourished at baseline. There are 300 million people who get enough food that live in countries where most of the food is imported. And there are a billion people in China who get enough food, most of it's grown in country, but they're poor. They're making less than $5 a day, and they are not going to be able to afford food at the greatly inflated prices that will result from this kind of contracture of world food production. 
And so we have concluded that a limited nuclear war in South Asia involving less than 0.03 percent of the world's nuclear arsenal could cause a global famine that killed up to 2 billion, with a B, people. The death of 2 billion people, should this happen, would not be the extinction of our species, but it would be the end of civilization as we know it. No civilization in human history has ever withstood a shock of this impact. And there's absolutely no reason to think that the very complex, interrelated, intricate economic system that we have built, which all of us depend on, would survive this kind of a jolt. That's a limited war. Let me talk for a few minutes about what a large-scale war would look like. I'm going to start by describing a nuclear attack, modern attack, on, on, a, on a large city. But again, this is not Hiroshima or Nagasaki. We don't know the exact targeting strategy of either the United States or Russia. But I've been told earlier this year by somebody in the, in the uh, peace community here in the United States who is quite familiar with US targeting strategy that he believes the United States still targets Moscow with 100 nuclear warheads, most of them 10 to 50 times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. And that doesn't count the weapons that the British, the French, and the Chinese target at Moscow. I'm going to describe something smaller than 100 nuclear warheads. I'm going to describe a model of a single 20, 20 megaton bomb going off over a large city that causes about the same amount of destruction as 15 to 20 of the size bombs that we have to. It's easier to describe a single explosion, so let me use that model if you let me. Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of that bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, temperatures would rise to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, and everything would disappear. The people, the trees, the buildings, the upper level of the earth itself would be vaporized. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the explosion would generate winds greater than 600 miles per hour. Mechanical forces of that magnitude destroy anything that human beings can build. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would still be so intense that automobiles would melt. And to a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would still be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Paper, cloth, gasoline, heating oil, wood, it all ignites. And you get hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature rises to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen is consumed, and every living thing dies. In the case of the New York metropolitan area, we're talking about something like 12 to 15 million people dead in half an hour. And if this were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this same level of destruction would occur at every major city in both countries. A report which we published in 2002 showed that if just 300 of the thousands of warheads in the Russian arsenal got through to urban targets in the United States, 75 million people would be dead in a half an hour. And more importantly, the entire economic infrastructure of the country would be destroyed. Everything that we depend on to keep ourselves alive. There'd be no electric grid. There'd be no internet. There'd be no public health system. There'd be no banking system. There'd be no food distribution system. There'd be no fuel distribution system. And in the months following this attack, the vast majority of the American population, those who did not die in the initial wave of explosions and fires, would also die from radiation exposure, from starvation, from exposure, from epidemic disease. And the same thing would happen in Russia. Altogether, something like a half a billion people dead from the direct local effects of this war. But again, it is the environmental disruption that is most important. A war in South Asia puts about 6.5 million tons of soot in the atmosphere. A war between the United States and Russia puts about a million, excuse me, 150 million tons of soot in the upper atmosphere. And that drops temperatures across the planet, an average of about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. What we essentially do is to produce an instant ice age over the course of about three days. We create conditions which have not been seen on this planet for 18,000 years, 
since the coldest moment of the last ice age. And under these conditions, all the ecosystems which have evolved in the current temperate time period would collapse. Food production across the planet would stop. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death. And it is possible that we would become extinct as a species. This is not just some kind of a nightmare scenario that you can cook up, sort of a worst case academic exercise. This is the danger that we are living with every single day that these weapons continue to exist. David alluded to the times when we've had almost experienced accidental nuclear war. We know of at least seven occasions where either Moscow or Washington <coughs> prepared to launch its nuclear weapons, took the domes off the, the missile silos, put the planes in the air, and started them towards their targets in the mistaken belief that they were already under attack. And the most recent of these that we know about, and there are probably others, took place in 1995, well after the end of the Cold War. And the conditions which existed at that time, which allowed that near disaster, have not changed significantly since. While we are sitting here tonight, the same kind of computer error could take place, and the missiles could fall. We have to understand, we are not living in a stable universe right now. We're living on borrowed time, and we have been for 70 years. And it's time to do something about this. It is absolutely insane that we put the entire planet at this kind of risk. And we don't have to do it. What I have described is the future that will be if we don't take action, because sooner or later our luck is going to run out. But it's not the future that must be. These weapons are not a force of nature. They are not an act of God. We built them with our hands, and we know how to take them apart. We've dismantled over 60,000 of them. What is missing is the political will to take apart the rest of them. And that's where all of us come in, building that political will, creating that political movement, and getting the policy of the nuclear weapon states, starting here in the United States, to change, to move away from a reliance on maintaining these weapons forever, to a commitment to getting rid of them. So let me turn things back over to David, and we're going to talk a little bit about the things that need to be done to actually get us out of this incredibly dangerous place that we found ourselves in. Well, after that sober picture, the question is, what do you do about it? What, what sort of changes would would, uh, would really help? And I want to talk about some of them, but uh, you know, we, we can uh, discuss more of this uh, afterwards. One of the things that I think is very important uh, is that it's very high priority to have ongoing discussions, military to military, and political to political discussions between countries. Uh, as I said before, relations with China seem to be relatively good these days. I'm hoping that, that it continues. Uh, but we need to make sure that there are really high level uh, talks between the militaries so that they understand better what their counterparts are thinking, that they get uh, some idea of who you call in the other country if a crisis starts to brew, things like that. As I said before, I think the United States should be talking with Russia about next steps in arms control. And as a first step of that would be uh, extending the New START Treaty. Uh, it, it is uh, due to expire in, 2000, in, in, 2011, in 2021. Uh, and if it goes away, it means that not only the current constraints on the number of deployed weapons goes away, but also all of the transparency and verification measures go away. Uh, and North Korea, I, I will come back to at the end. North Korea is another case where uh, discussions should be taking place. A second thing is, uh, I believe that the United States should declare that it will not be the first country to use nuclear weapons. Uh, this is sometimes called a no first use pledge. Uh, it's also referred to as a sole purpose pledge. In other words, saying that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons should be to deter the use of uh, nuclear weapons by other countries or, if necessary, to respond. The, the um, Obama administration in 2010 it did a, a, a review of its nuclear policy, uh, and it took a step toward a no first use policy. It said that uh, sole purpose should be the uh, uh, sole purpose should be the goal of U.S. policy, but it said it wasn't quite ready to go there yet. Uh, and so it said there, said, quote, there remains a narrow range of contingencies in which U.S. nuclear weapons will still play a role in deterring a conventional or chemical biological weapons attack against the United States or its allies. So in other words, these are cases where the United States uh, 
reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in response to a non-nuclear attack. Uh, now, in practice, uh, the way it defined countries that we use those against, in practice, there are basically four, which would be Russia, China, North Korea, and possibly Iran, depending on, on what you think about uh, whether or not Iran has uh, satisfied its, its um, obligations under the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So we're close to the point where you would have a sole, sole uh, purpose, a declaration, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, I think it should be clear from things we've talked about that the United States should end a hair trigger alert in its ICBMs. The reason the United States has this policy is that um, early in the Cold War, the United States had land-based missiles. Uh, the enemy, uh, Soviet Union at that point, knew where they were to target them. Uh, the United States was worried that if the Soviet Union launched an all-out attack, uh, it might think that it could take out our, our ability to retaliate, and therefore deterrence would be weak. And so the idea was to have sensors that would uh, detect an incoming attack, and if there was a sign of in incoming attack, you would have the ability to launch your missiles before the incoming missiles could land. Now it takes about 30 minutes for a missile to reach either from the Soviet Union to the United States or vice versa, and so that's the thing that sets the time scale here. You have to be able to detect a launch, figure out what it is, make, get everything ready, make a decision, and launch within 30 minutes. Uh, and what that does is it puts a very constraint, it, it constrains your decision making on whether or not to launch something. And, and uh, if you talk to people, uh, as I have, who used to uh, be in the business of launching ballistic missiles, they say that the process you get is a very streamlined process because you have to make decisions quickly. That's really not what you want with nuclear weapons. And today it's not needed because the United States has most of its nuclear force on submarines, uh, which are at sea, they're underwater, they can't be targeted. And so this hair trigger uh, issue that we have is not only dangerous, but the original purpose that it was, it was created to respond to no longer exists. And so there's really no good reason for this. Uh, as I mentioned before, <coughs> some experts believe today uh, an accidental war may be the most likely way for the war to start. Even current Secretary of Defense Mattis has talked about concerns about um, hair trigger alert and has, has raised the option of even getting rid of land-based missiles altogether. So if we have submarines and they're vulnerable, maybe we should get rid of land-based missiles. Uh, there's also a, a uh, ongoing discussions at this point of how do you limit the President's ability to single-handedly order the launch of nuclear weapons. Uh, we just a couple days ago put out a, a fact sheet um, looking at um, how other countries, how other nu nuclear countries make, uh, make the decision to launch nuclear weapons. And what you find is that, that uh, the, the U.S. system is not the way everybody does it, that there are alternatives to this, and that in fact uh, there are ways to do it that make sure that uh, if you had a, a problem in a, a case in which somebody's judgment was impaired, that that, uh, that would not lead to a launch. The classic example people talk about this is in the, in the late days of President Nixon's uh, administration. Uh, he knew he was going to be forced from office. He was depressed. He was apparently drinking heavily. And the Secretary of Defense at that point was concerned that, that his judgment was impaired, that he might do something crazy, uh, and told the Joint Chiefs that if the President orders a launch of nuclear weapons, don't do anything until you talk to them. Now, that was not something, that was not a legal thing that he was allowed to do, but I think people recognized the problem and said, you know, okay, we have to work around this. Uh, our sense is that you shouldn't have to work around it, things should be, should be organized differently. And so we are in the process of looking at options for this, and as I said, uh, Congress is looking at this as well, and so hopefully this is something that uh, people will start to take more seriously. And finally, let me just say a few words about the North Korean situation, which is something I follow pretty closely. Um, if you talk, if you go back and look at statements of um, the Trump administration's military advisors, uh, essentially all of them say that there are no good military options uh, in solving the North Korean problem. And there are two reasons for that. The first one is that we don't know where all North Korea's military uh, facilities and weapons are. Uh, they're very good at tunneling. They've hidden a lot of things. 
Uh, and so the, the first part of it is that even if we wanted to try and get rid of their military capability, uh, we have no guarantee we can do that. The second thing is that if there was an attack, uh, the South Korean capital of Seoul is very close to the border with North Korea. North Korea has hundreds of artillery tubes uh, aimed at, at Seoul, which can carry conventional uh, chemical biological weapons. And so the concern is if you did try to have a military strike, that it would lead to very high casualty rates in <laughs> Seoul. People talk about uh, increasing sanctions on, on North Korea, and that, in fact, has, has been done uh, in recent months. But I think almost everybody agrees that while sanctions can put pressure on, sanctions are not going to solve the problem. Uh, people have looked to China to try and solve the problem, and China has been quite uh, frank about this. It said, uh, we're happy to be part of the solution. We're happy to get people together and try and make things go forward. But at the bottom, this is an issue between North Korea and the United States, and those are the two parties that really are going to have to take uh, the, first, the first and major efforts at solving this. And where that leads you, I think, is that uh, this is a case where, uh, like it or not, diplomacy is really uh, the only solution. Um, but better than that, uh, there is reason to believe, at least in the past, that North Korea has been willing to, to negotiate. If you go back and look at the history of negotiations uh, during the Clinton administration, and you talk to negotiators who were uh, actually sitting down at the table with the North Koreans, uh, they felt in, in late 2000 that they were a couple months away from uh, a verified agreement that would have stopped North Korea's production of plutonium and their ballistic missile program. And unfortunately, what happened at that point was uh, the Clinton administration ran out of time. Uh, the George W. Bush administration came in. Uh, that administration was deadlocked over how, what their policy should be. They broke off the negotiations uh, to do a review of them. They never got back to it. And so those things sort of fell apart and, and we are where we are today. Whether or not uh, negotiations at this point would, would actually work, uh, nobody knows, but I think uh, uh, the point is that it's really the only way to try and solve this, and I think uh, it, there has to be a good faith effort to, to see whether it's possible. Some of the really critical steps that we need to take immediately to lower the risk of nuclear war. But I think we also have to address the fundamental problem, which is the simple existence of these arsenals. Because as long as they exist, as long as there are thousands of nuclear warheads in the world, there's the danger that they're going to be used. And we just have to stop pretending that nothing will ever go wrong. And that's essentially what US policy is doing. It's a hope that our good luck will continue forever. And there's absolutely no rational reason to assume that's going to be the case, because luck doesn't always stay good. And sooner or later, something goes wrong. I think right now, we are really at a fundamental crossroad. The Trump administration and the Obama administration before that proposed an enormous expenditure to extend and enhance the U.S. nuclear arsenal for decades to come. It's projected as they said that they'll be spending $1.2 trillion over the next 30 years to enhance all three legs of the nuclear arsenal, the submarines, the land-based missiles, and the bombers. There's another path that we can and should take, and that is a serious pursuit of an international agreement to eliminate nuclear weapons. The United States is pledged by treaty to do this. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has been in effect since 1970, requires the states which have nuclear weapons to engage in good faith negotiations to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. None of them are doing this. None of them have currently any intention of doing this. And that's what has to change. The non-nuclear weapon states, for their part, in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, agreed never to build nuclear weapons. And they have watched for 40 years as they kept their part of the bargain, and the nuclear weapon states violated their part. And finally, they became impatient with this, and they set out on their own to create a new treaty to put pressure on the nuclear weapon states. And over the last three or four years, there's been an intense diplomatic effort which culminated in a vote at the United Nations last July 7th, under which, whereby a by a vote of 122 to 1, a new treaty was adopted, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which bans the possession, the development, the construction, the transportation, the funding, the testing of nuclear weapons. 
hardly that treaty has been open for signature. When 50 countries sign and ratify the treaty, it becomes international law. The United States and the other nuclear weapon states have refused to participate in this entire process. They didn't even go to the negotiations. And they're saying that they will never sign this treaty. I don't know how they expect the rest of the world to uphold the non-proliferation part of the NPT if they will not even begin the process of disarming that they are legally required to pursue. And so what we need to do here in the United States is to jumpstart this process. We need to get our government to take a 180 degree turn in its nuclear policy away from this plan to spend $1.2 trillion to maintain a nuclear arsenal forever and to instead take up its existing legal responsibilities to negotiate the elimination of its weapons. I don't think that this can take place in a vacuum. The United States can't disarm unilaterally. It's just a political non-starter, and I'm not even sure it would make sense if the U.S. did this. But the U.S. can provide leadership to the international community in negotiating the treaty that needs to be negotiated. In the 1980s, there was the Soviet Union that took the leadership role in ending the Cold War arms race. They took some unilateral steps. They stopped their nuclear testing. They challenged the United States to join them. I don't see anybody in the current, so current Russian leadership who's going to play the role that Gorbachev played in the 80s. I don't think Donald Trump is going to play that role here in the United States. But we have an election in 2020. And what we need to do between now and then is to create a climate in this country whereby the next administration that takes office on January 20th, 2021, is firmly committed to pursuing the elimination of nuclear weapons. Not just at the rhetorical level as President Obama was, but a policy level. We need a new president who will appoint to the State Department, the Defense Department, the National Security Council, people who are dedicated to eliminating the nuclear threat once and for all. Now that's, this effort may not be successful even if the United States undertakes it. We may try to negotiate with the other nuclear weapon states and find we can't get them to go along. But we have to try, because if we don't, if we continue on the path that we are on, then all of the horrible things that I described to you before are going to happen in your lifetime. And everything that we hold dear in this world is going to be destroyed. Everything that we've inherited from our ancestors, everything that we should be leaving to our children will be gone. But again, this does not have to be. This is purely a question of whether we're going to win this political struggle or not. In the 1980s, we faced a similar danger. The Reagan administration came to power with this bizarre idea that they could fight and win a nuclear war. It was U.S. nuclear policy at that time to prepare to fight a nuclear war in the belief that we could fight and win. Over the course of three years, an incredible movement took shape across this country that ultimately involved millions of people. The largest demonstration in U.S. history, a million people in Central Park in June of 1982. Other millions of people around the country demanding a sane nuclear policy that did not envision nuclear war as its goal. And to the surprise and shock of all of us, we won. In the course of three years, U.S. nuclear policy did a complete turn. From the summer of 1983, when we deployed new missiles in Europe, specifically so we could launch a first attack on Moscow, a first strike attack on Moscow. That was the summer of 1983. In January of 1984, Ronald Reagan gave his State of the Union address and said, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. The victory was so complete and so sudden, we missed it. We, we, we thought he was just you know, blowing smoke uh, in preparation for the 1984 election, but he wasn't. It actually changed his thinking about this in response to the incredible pressure and to the education that we did. Because one of the really frightening things is that the leaders of the country, then and now, don't know the things that I talked to you about before, about what's going to happen if nuclear weapons are used. When we go and talk with them, we are all the time horrified by how ignorant they are about what's going to happen if they press the button. So that's what we need to do. We need to recreate what we've already done once. We need to build a movement that will change U.S. nuclear policy. And we've actually uh, created a, a tool that we think we can use to help do this. Uh, the early 1980s anti-nuclear movement was built around a campaign called the Nuclear Freeze. It was a simple statement 
that said the policy of the United States and the Soviet Union should be to freeze their arsenals and not build any more nuclear weapons. And that statement was taken to institutions all around the country, city councils, town meetings, unions, church communities, professional associations, and they all signed on to it. And it became the basis for this national movement. This movement started in Western Massachusetts, where I currently live, and a few months ago, in conjunction with people at the Union of Concerned Scientists and some people at PSR, a group of us in Western Massachusetts launched a similar campaign. Um, we're calling it Back from the Brink, a call to prevent nuclear war. And it's a very simple statement of the five things that U.S. nuclear policy needs to embody and embrace. No first use, no ability of the president to start war by, by his or herself, um, no weapons on air trigger alert, no $1.2 trillion expenditure to enhance the nuclear arsenal, and most importantly, a fundamental commitment to seek a world free of nuclear weapons, to begin negotiations with the other United States. Um, there are copies of, of the statement. It's very short. It's the stuff at the top. The stuff at the bottom is just explanation. Uh, there are copies on both tables. And I would urge you all to take one of these at the end of the discussion tonight and look at it and figure out how you can use this. No one of us is going to solve this problem by ourselves. But if we're going to solve this problem, every one of us needs to do that part of the job which is ours to do. And part of that means figuring out what you can do best. So in Western Massachusetts, where Sean and I live, uh, we're taking this to every town, uh, town meeting, to every city council. We're taking it to the local church groups. And we're trying to get them all to sign on to this and to, to, to send their affirmation to the state legislature and to the congressional delegation. Here in New Hampshire, it would be great if people did the same thing. If it went to if the university got a position, if the student government got a position, position. Um, if any fraternities or any um, clubs or associations you belong to would sign on to the state. If you have connections to town meetings or city councils, if you would bring it to those political bodies. If there are unions on campus or other unions that you have contact with, if you would take it to them and get them to sign on to it as well. And this very simple local action is a critical building block, I believe, that will launch a national movement that will change its nuclear policy. And we've got three years to do this, so there's a lot of work to do for them. When I talk to, to young people, to students, I feel a bit guilty because the things I've told you tonight about what's going to happen are pretty horrible. And by telling you about them, I put it real burden <coughs> on your shoulders because once you know about this, you have to do something about it. And you just can't walk away when you know the whole world is in danger. And that's unfair because you had nothing to do with creating this problem. It is not in that sense your responsibility. But in a much more important sense, it is your responsibility. Because if you and me and people like us don't do something about this, then all the things I've talked about but if this is a responsibility that I put on your shoulders, I would also argue that this is something of a gift that we have given you tonight as well. Every one of us wants to do something good with our life. Those of us alive today have been given the opportunity to save the world. And there is nothing better than anyone can ever do with their life. So perhaps in that spirit, I would ask you to take up this whole challenge and to view this as really great adventure of our era. We can either go to a horrible future that is really beyond our imagining, or we can avoid that and save the world and give the world a chance to look at all the other problems we have to deal with as well. So let me stop at this point and we'll take questions, comments, whatever. Thanks very much. Um, could you all hear that? 
district into district plan if there's a nuclear attack. Um, I think it, it, it is the carefully considered judgment of the medical community and the international uh, disaster response community, notably the Red Cross, that no planning is uh, worthwhile. Um, in the event of a single nuclear bomb in a city, like a terrorist attack or something like that, if you had very sophisticated advanced planning in place, you might be able to cut the casualties by a few thousand of the hundreds of thousands that would take place. But you'd have to know where the attack was coming, which city was going to be targeted, and so on. In terms of a large-scale attack, there's just nothing you can do. There's, there's nothing. The, the Red Cross, which is the world's premier disaster response organization, has, has issued this as a statement. But they want the world to know, in the event of nuclear war, there's nothing the Red Cross can do. Right, I think if I'm not mistaken, they uh, issued in all their education systems um, to get underneath the desk. Get under the desk? Yeah. That was, I, I'm yeah. sure that was, that was used back in the 60s, yeah. and they absolved that, and now they actually, it's actually been reintroduced back in, in Hawaii. Yeah, um, I, I, I went to, the town I grew up in had such bad schools that we didn't even conduct carbon drills. But most people growing up in the 50s and 60s did do these drills. They got under desks and said this was going to do anything. And, you know, basically what this was was a charade to convince people that there was some response possible. I think we have to understand it in those terms. Um, not only is it useless, but it's really, it was quite pernicious the way, we, the way it was used. It was used to create the illusion that protection was possible when in fact everyone knew it wasn't. I'm wondering what you both uh, think, what your opinion is of the Marquis Lou bill, and uh, how many people have heard of it here? Anybody heard of the Marquis Lou? Not many, so what do you think? So Representative Markey, uh, so Rep Representative Lou and Senator Markey, uh, actually uh, before the election, last uh, congressional cycle, introduced a joint bill uh, that would say that the, that, the, that the United States president could not uh, use nuclear weapons first in a conflict without a, with, um, until uh, Congress had declared war. And the, the argument was that using nuclear weapons is, is in fact a declaration of war and that's something that the Constitution says that uh, Congress does uh, and not the president. Uh, I think it's been a, a really useful thing to try and educate people about the um, uh, the concern about how the current system is set up. It certainly spawned uh, discussions about even um, uh, the War Powers Act and whether or not you know what role Congress should have even a non nuclear uh, There was a, some lawyers recently who were talking about it, and they said. Uh, to some extent, they thought that the Marquis Lou bill was redundant, that in fact, what it's saying is, is just repeating what's in the Constitution. And that their concern is that by introducing this legislation, it suggests that that, that isn't what's in the Constitution. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's been a very useful vehicle for, for discussion. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear more legal people weigh in. It's like one or two questions. First, what was the reason the non-proliferation from the UN was not signed? Did they give a reason? The, the new treaty? Um, yeah, the, the, well, when the process started, the United States and the other nuclear weapon states all said that um, <coughs> this was a distraction, this process of negotiating this treaty, from the serious efforts they were undertaking to actually eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a statement that is basically received as an incredible insult by the entire rest of the world because the U.S. and the other nuclear weapon states are engaged in any serious efforts to get rid of nuclear weapons. And, um, but I think the, 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 the reason, the real reason, uh, is that the United States and the other nuclear weapon states don't want to give up the nuclear weapons. Uh, the Nuclear Posture Review in 2010, that David referred to, says that the main reason the U.S. has nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attack from other countries. But the fact is, nuclear weapons play a much bigger role than that in the U.S. military thinking. We don't just see them as a way of deterring other countries from attacking us with nuclear weapons. 
We see them as a way of projecting military and, and national power on the world stage, and we don't want to give that up. The United States has threatened to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear countries repeatedly. We use them against Japan. We threatened to use them against China during the Korean War. We threatened to use them against China during the um, crisis over the Channel Islands uh, in the late 1950s. We threatened to use them during the Iranian Civil War in 1978. We threatened to use them against Saddam Hussein in 1991 and again in 2003. We talked about using them against Libya. We, the, there are elements of the U.S. government which see these weapons as a legitimate way of projecting national strength. And they are willing to accept the incredible risks that I was talking about in order to preserve this strength, this force, this weapon. It's an incredibly dangerous mindset out there. But that's the reason why we don't want to sign this treaty. So the second part of the question is what do you view as, or what do you think would be effective Behavior modification for thought process. Well, you know, I think I think there are three things. There are, th there are three groups in the country that want to hold out to nuclear weapons. There's a relatively small group that's making a lot of money off the nuclear enterprise as a totally corrupt motivation, and it is what it is. Um, there's a group of people that I was just referring to who believe that nuclear weapons are enhance our national strength. And it's worth having that additional power regardless of the risk. I think it's going to be very hard to compete with those two groups, frankly. Then there's a very large group of people who support the possession of nuclear weapons because they believe that deterrence makes us safe. That having these weapons is a reasonable way to keep other countries that have nuclear weapons from attacking us. And I think what's going to change things is when we are able to educate people about the real situation of deterrence. Mm -hmm. And there are, two, there are two aspects about, about that that I think are worth mentioning. One is, deterrence is the idea that, that, that as long as we have nuclear weapons, nobody will ever attack us because we would attack them and we will never attack anybody else that has nuclear weapons because then they will attack us. The problem with this doctrine is that it's already failed repeatedly. There are six times when either the United States or Moscow began the preparation of launching their nuclear weapons, abandoning deterrence, saying they were going to go to nuclear war. And on each of these occasions, as former Secretary of Defense McNamara said, we lucked out. It was luck that prevented nuclear war, not deterrence. This, this supposedly, you know, fail-safe fail doctrine has just failed repeatedly. The other, there were three, three, three factors. The second one is the one that they've referred to before, just the possibility of accident. Uh, you know, computer chips don't know about deterrence. Uh, many of the near misses we've had have been triggered by various kinds of computer errors. And the more sophisticated the systems get, the more complicated the computer systems, the greater the likelihood of something going wrong. There are four factors, actually. The third one is, is cyber terrorism, which we haven't talked about yet. But we used to think the worst thing a terrorist could do would be to get hold of a single nuclear bomb, bring it into Washington or New York, and blow it up. What we're now understanding is the greater danger from terrorists is that they could hack into our command and control systems, or the Russians, and actually launch one or more of our missiles, or perhaps more likely create a false alert in which either Moscow or Washington thought they were under attack and launched a counterattack against the other side. And then the, fourth, the final argument is when we get to a little bit political, which I think we just have to confront head on, and that's the Trump factor. The United States has said for 30 years that it would be impermissible for a single nuclear warhead to fall into the wrong hands, by which we meant a rogue state or a terrorist group. We have just turned over 6,800 nuclear warheads to Donald Trump, who in the judgment of his own Secretary of State is an effing moron when it comes to nuclear weapons. This is, this is a situation, I mean, we have to face this. What does this say? We have a system in which we're supposed to have wise, responsible, knowledgeable leaders who will be deterred, who will not use nuclear weapons. And we have Donald Trump. I can't close the whole enterprise out the door. And we just, we have to acknowledge that. We have to, I don't think we will absorb the full significance of that. But we are sitting in a situation where a guy who is felt by his military advisors to be unstable can launch a nuclear war on his own initiative and no one can do anything about it legally. 
So I think those arguments are what's going to tip the balance. We've got to bring those to the American people and get them to understand that far from the instruments of our security, nuclear weapons are the greatest threat to our safety. And I think we can do that, because it's true. And the truth always wins out of it, as long as you speak it. Partially in response to that previous question. First, if it, if it is such a grave and serious threat to remove and annihilate these nuclear weapons from all the nuclear states, why are we only trying to start, why are we only starting now with, with these kind of movements and these kind of things? Because you say we've been doing it before, but it's never, and the last big success we had was in the 80s. Why are we only starting now when Donald Trump is president and we didn't really push for this that much, as much as under Obama? Well, actually, the movement that, 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 you know, that we represent uh, has been gathering steam for the last five or six years. Uh, Trump has certainly given a lot of evidence to it. But um, it, the thing that I think triggered the modern anti-nuclear movement worldwide was the publication in the, in, in the 2000s of, of these studies about limited nuclear war. Um, people all over the world, in Latin America, in Africa, in parts of Asia, which are nuclear weapons free zones, felt that they didn't have to worry about this anymore. And then they discovered that even a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan was going to cause a devastating famine in their countries. And that played a huge role in launching the, the movement that led to the, the, the recently concluded Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The increasing intense relations between the United States and Russia, which go back about three or four years, have played a role in this. The increase in fighting between India and Pakistan, and there was fighting, actual fighting, you know, every single day on the border in Kashmir, and the situation in Korea. All of these things are, are, have inspired to recreate in people's minds the understanding that nuclear weapons are around and that they're dangerous. When the Cold War ended in 1991, everybody just thought this problem had gone away. There's a, I mean, this palpable sigh of relief across the whole planet. People figured, wow, we dodged the bullet. <coughs> and we had. We didn't have the nuclear war in the 1980s as everybody thought we would. But we didn't go all the way and get rid of all the weapons. And now we're, we're understanding that we're starting to problem. And also, one, one, more, one more question. Even if we were to take the necessary steps to seriously eliminate all of our nuclear arsenal, what's to prevent the other states, or what's to inspire or motivate the other states to do the same? Because we could take the big step and eliminate all our nuclear weapons, but the other nuclear states could not do anything and keep their weapons. And then if we went through and actually kept our promise, and then these other states had nuclear weapons, especially in case of Russia or Pakistan, they went rogue and attacked us, how would we defend ourselves? Well, I mean, I think nobody's talking about the idea of doing it unilaterally. The idea, and what I had talked about was trying to start discussions toward getting the countries of the world to, to uh, move in this direction and figure out how you do it. And one of the things that people have talked about is um, what kind of verification do you need? How would you, as you move forward with this, what kind of transparency would you need to make sure that I felt comfortable that other countries were doing what they were supposed to do? So we're really talking about a step-by-step -step process where people feel comfortable as they go forward. My own feeling is that by the time we make some of the changes we've talked about and get down to significantly lower numbers than we have today, the world will look somewhat different. The level of communication and trust between the countries will look different. And that will open up possibilities for you know, further political steps and verification that would be necessary. For it. But nobody's talking about doing it in a new way. Of course, I was not referring to, I, I should have made this clear, though. I was not referring to unilateral, uh, just the United States by itself reducing its arsenal. Of course, like it has about that. But, but the idea that some one, one or more countries could be cheating. Of course, they yeah. could be manipulating the talks, they could, each, they could look like they're getting rid of, but still have a secret stockpile, and yeah. then they could betray us and then launch nukes at our European mm -hmm. allies. And how would we, if that was the case, and, the, and a surprise assault was launched at us or our allies, how would we defend ourselves if we had no nuclear weapons? Well, you know, I think that the bottom line is that, that the treaty that is ultimately agreed to is going to, it's not going to be this kind of warm, fuzzy kind of document. This is going to have to be a very, very rigorous agreement that we come to. 
with, with enforcement procedures, with verification procedures, uh, and with, um, with a real commitment on the part of the whole world that, that no one is going to violate this treaty. We have a lot of experience with this. The US and the, and the Soviet Union and the US and Russia have, by treaty, eliminated enormous numbers of nuclear weapons with very um, intrusive inspection regimes to, guarantee, to verify that both sides are adhering to it. And we feel pretty comfortable, and the Russians do too, that the other side is adhering to the treaty and doing what it's supposed to. Uh, we're going to have to have the same kind of arrangement with all the countries that are party to this. Um, and it's not going to be easy. I mean, this is not something people are going to take on in good faith. Um, but we really don't have any, any alternative. We have to get rid of these weapons. And so, yes, it's going to be difficult to figure out how to do this, but that's the job we have to figure that out. Because if we don't, we stay where we are today, except we don't stay here indefinitely because the situation is not stable. This is living up to us. I was wondering, since, uh, since the Cold War started with the uh, United States and Russia both gave nuclear weapons, there hasn't been a large scale conventional warfare between uh, like major powers, major military powers throughout the world. So like, wouldn't it make sense to keep some nuclear weapons for deterrence? Because mutual certain deterrence has stopped Russia and the United States from going to war. And I think that will Oh. It is one of the best ways to keep that's the world a, safe. That's a great question. It's a very it's an argument that's frequently advanced. I think there's some major flaws in it. Uh, there have been some major wars between large countries. The United States and China fought a big war in Korea uh, after the United States and, and Russia both had nuclear weapons, and, and those weapons did not prevent that war. Uh, there have been lots of other proxy wars that the United States and Russia fought with each other in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Nicaragua other places around the world. And in fact, the world has not been a particularly peaceful place in the nuclear weapons of There has not been a generalized war in Europe, that's true. But there has been warfare in Europe, in the Balkans, uh, in Ukraine now. Um, and the idea that you need to have nuclear weapons to prevent war, I think is somewhat, somewhat based on the, the sort of the, the circumstances of the first half of the 20th century, where there were two generalized wars in Europe just 20 years apart. But you know, prior to World War I, Europe went for 100 years from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the outbreak of World War I without a generalized war. And it was not nuclear weapons that kept that peace. It was diplomacy and a determination that war was not the best option. So I, I think, it's, it's mis I think we, we, we give an inflated value to the role that nuclear weapons have played in preventing a generalized war in Europe on both of those counts. There really actually have been a lot of wars despite nuclear weapons. And we know of significant periods in history where we've been able to avoid generalized war without nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you're familiar with the 50s and 60s, there were drills for our communities, and obviously we know that that's not going to do anything under an attack. <coughs> so, in today's, uh, I remember back in the 80s, growing up as a little kid, seeing PSAs, and today now you know tech days. So what you mentioned earlier about the, the, uh, the facts on uh, the detonation from the ICBM, um, I think just having that knowledge in itself, as a, uh, <coughs> maybe a small bit of description, have that knowledge would be announced um, in some large, large fashion. I think that would probably stir up a lot of, a lot of best to get stuff done like uh, back in the early 90s. So, and social media gives us a chance to try to do that. And so one of the things that, um, that we've been doing is, is trying to, uh, for example, we just put out a... a I apologize. Um, my question is to all the, uh, the environmental factors that goes into uh, detonation. Is that also known back in the 50s and 60s as well? Um, the, some of the stuff was known, some of it wasn't. The, the climate effects of nuclear war were first described in the early 1980s by a group of scientists led by Carl Sagan here in the United States. And that, that nuclear winter, a series of nuclear winter studies were published in 83, 82, 83, around then. They, the studies were repeated in 2006 using the more advanced climate models and the more specific computers that we have now. 
and the original nuclear winter conclusions were confirmed. But back in the 50s and 60s, people did not know about uh, the climate disruption that would take place, and it wasn't factored in at all. States conducts military exercises on the South Korean border. Would you mind speaking a little louder? Sorry. Speak up. I heard that the United States conducts military exercises on the South Korean border, and that's the reason North Korea wants to nuke us. What are your comments on that? Well, it is. Uh, the, so the question was about the uh, uh, exercises, the United, military exercises the United States uh, conducts along the, the border with North Korea. Uh, as part of its defense treaty with South Korea, uh, there are military exercises the two countries do together. Uh, and from North Korea's point of view, uh, those looked like uh, uh, not only preparations, uh, you know, exercises to learn how to invade, but North Korea says you know they could be a pretense for actually launching the invasion. So from North Korea's point of view, uh, it sees itself facing a, a military a, a militarily stronger uh, set of, of countries, South Korea and the United States. Uh, and it, you, it says that's one of the reasons that it, that it uh, feels like it needs, it needs nuclear weapons. But, you know, that may well be true. I can imagine from the North Korean point of view that they feel like um, they, you know, countries have been overthrown. They've seen Saddam Hussein be overthrown. And, is uh, Gaddafi be overthrown and then killed. And, uh, and one of the things North Koreans have said is that the, what they take away from that is that countries that don't have nuclear weapons uh, are, can be overrun by the United States with its allies. And so that's certainly a part of the thinking of the North Korean military. So we may not agree with that, but I think that's the way to do it. I'm wondering about how we approach our neighbors and talk to them about this. Because I can just see people thinking that, oh, this is fake news. This is, I don't believe what you're telling me about nuclear winter. Can you describe how you think we can convince people that, that know us that this is Truthful information. I'm sure there will be some people who try to reject it, especially now we have the, this term fake news. But I must tell you, um, since we've started bringing this data to people uh, about four or five years ago, I haven't had a single person who I've talked to about this say, I don't think this is true. Um, it, this is published in, you know, in the scientific literature. It has not been challenged uh, in any significant way. Uh, there are numerous studies. Uh, about it, and it's just, it is the state of current science. Um, the studies are being done again. Um, Alan Novak and Brian Toon, who have been the, sort of the lead authors on the climate studies, have received a very substantial grant to do all of this uh, in, uh, in a much more uh, rigorous way, uh, in terms of being able to uh, get a lot more um, computer time to run the studies in, in, in greater depth. But at this point, the examination of, of what would happen with a limited nuclear war or a large-scale nuclear war. Those scenarios have been run on three of the six climate models that are used in the world today. And all three of them come up with basically the same conclusion. There are slight variations, but they're basically the same story. So I think there will always be people who don't who think the world's flat, but I, I don't think we're going to find that many of them. This data tends to, I think, to resonate very powerfully with people. And it's just a question of getting it out to them. Bridget, I just wanted to mention before we wrap up, if, if folks are interested in, in uh, getting involved, uh, like Ira said, uh, certainly they can come see me. Um, we have many different ways that people can, uh, I know a lot of you uh, come from other states, uh, active in your home states, and on some of this legislation, you should see me or Hannah, who's sitting up in the front row, um, and we can give you our cards and, and talk with you about how you might get involved. Sean, could you tell um, people about the local groups too? Um, well, how are you? Let me just say that um, in addition, we also have some local groups. Carolina 
and Sandra and Bill are part of Seco's peace response. Judy and I are part of a group called the Nuclear Weapons Working Group that is trying to work statewide to do exactly what Ira and David have been talking about, about educating people. There's some material here on the front table in addition to the UCS and Physicians for Social Responsibility information. And if you give your uh, email to me and Judy, we'll make sure that you hear about other things that are going on, including our day of action to prevent war with North Korea happening this Saturday. And that, there's a sign-up sheet on that table for local groups. Okay. Um, if you're one of Professor Ingram's students and you didn't get one of the sheets at the beginning, just see him on your way out to make sure he has you for the credit. And if he did, you could just drop it here and you're all set to go. I would just like to thank our speakers for coming out. And The first thing that's going to happen when you all leave here tonight is you're going to start to forget the stuff that we talked about. And I'm not just talking about the usual process of forgetting the result. You're going to start actively erasing this stuff. What we talked about is incredibly uncomfortable, painful stuff. And the normal way that the human brain reacts to that is to just suppress it and push it out of mind. Please don't do this. You have to, it, this is painful stuff. And I don't want you to think about it day and night. But you have to hold on to this enough. You have to keep this information enough in your mind so that it affects your behavior, so that you actually do something about it. And if all of us do that, we're going to come out of this okay. I mean, David and I and Sean have lived with this stuff for, for, for decades. We've been working on this issue. Uh, I, I give talks similar to the one that I gave tonight several times a month. I think about this stuff all the time. I'm not a, I'm not a depressed person, and I'm not a pessimistic person. I truly believe that we can get rid of these weapons. It's just a question of getting ourselves all through the world. And so please, take up this challenge. Become a part of this. And, and figure out what it is that you can do. Take copies of, of the, uh, the pledge, the, the call to prevent nuclear war, and sign up on the, on the sheets. And figure out what it is that you can do in your life to make a difference here. Because everyone can play a key role in this. Keep me up here. Regardless of your my class or not, I want to get your name, rank, serial number, email address, so we can get in contact with you.